Greetings, it's Adam with the Rata Non Grata, and if we jump into our DeLorean with its installed flux capacitor, and we go back to the year 1988, Atari was actually riding kind of high, as they had some success with their Atari ST computers, and they finally got the Atari 7800 out the door back in 1986, and in 1987 they released, for some reason, the Atari XEGS, and the Atari 2600 was still performing relatively well. Um, looking at the sales numbers for the Atari 7800, 1988 is the year where it sold the most units. And of course, at that price for $89.99, it was a pretty nice deal. It could play all of your Atari 2600 games. And I'm pretty sure that was quite a bit more affordable than the NES or the Master System, although I guess I should look up those numbers. Uh, but I've always been a little bit baffled by the XEGS, uh, just because it's a repackaged Atari XC65 or in a way kind of like a, an Atari 800 XL. So it had 64 kilobytes of RAM, was compatible with all the Atari 800 XL cartridges or the Atari 800 and 400 cartridges and such. Um, but as trying to do this home computer sort of thing and uh, they, they kept targeting it against the NES and, and saying two systems in one for twice the video fun. It just didn't really take to the market. Uh, in my humble opinion, what they should have done is any of the resources that they were going to spend on the XE, they should have just thrown it all into the 7800, which was a more powerful system. And so instead should have given that a light gun, should have produced all those games that they did as XE focused games for the 7800. And that probably would have gotten further for them and maybe helped push the 7800 to have more than the 3.7 million sales that it eventually ended up having, which was commendable, but it was still way, way, way behind the NES. But um, why am I talking about this exactly? And of course, the title of this video says The Road to the Jaguar, the Super XC. And so what is the Atari Super XE game system? Well, thanks to Kurt Vendel, who uh, several years ago on Atari Age uh, shared this document that got into what the Super XE GS was supposed to be. Uh, you'll see that it was dated June 21st, 1988. And it's uh, eight pages long, and this gets into what they were hoping to do. But one reason why I'm doing this video a little differently than the Atari 3200 or the Jaguar 2 videos is that there's no circuit board uh, for this that existed. It never really got past this document, and as Kurt said, a few meetings after this. Um, but let's say that Atari decided that in 1988 that this was the way they were going to go. What would this system have been capable of, at least on paper? Again, it might not have been capable of all this. This might have just been dreaming, whatever. But it first stop, starts off talking about objects. You could have 64 objects per frame, 16 objects per line, 16 colors with those objects, 32 colors in a frame, two to the 12th power colors possibility. Uh, I think that's misspelled there. Um, if I'm doing my math right, that would mean 4,096 colors. So putting it somewhere in the realm of the Amiga, the Commodore Amiga computers. Um, not sure what the 1X, 2X, 4X, 4 are all about. Um, but if we go down, the background would have one cell map with 40 characters by 24 characters. Uh, the person who wrote this also wrote character with an O. Okay. Uh, four colors per character. 8 by 8 pixels per character, 32 colors a frame. Again, the 4,096 colors is what they were hoping for. And that's one thing you could always say with Atari systems is they were always great on color. I mean, from the 2600 to the Jaguar, uh, they were a little bit ahead of their time in how many colors they could display uh, compared to their contemporaries. Um, Yes, the Jaguar eventually, you know, the PS1 and Saturn and N64 were all able to do 16.8 million colors or whatever it was, but the Jaguar did it first. Anyways, um, 64 characters by 32 characters in the frame memory. Um, you have pattern memory, dynamically 
changeable. <laughs> um, and then you have a, what looks like a screen resolution layout here, although they get into more details of that on this next page. And so what they were aiming for was having three graphics modes. One would have be, or two of them would do 320 lines by 192, pick, or 320 pixels wide by 192 lines deep per frame at 16 colors per pixel. Um, for some reason those both are, okay, one is with rotation and one was without rotation, which is why you have the two there. Um, rotating the entire frame, I suppose. Um, back in the day, rotating 2D sprites was still kind of a new thing. Uh, but then you had a 640 by 192 pixel uh, resolution mode with four colors per pixel, which would have put it in the realm of the Apple II GS. Uh, now granted, the Apple II GS had been released like three or four years prior to when this might have gotten out the, uh, yeah, by the time this probably would have gotten out of the door, it would have been 89 or 1990. <laughs> um, if this was just a text document, unless they were somehow able to hash it out extremely fast. Uh, but that just seems unlikely. Um, but then we get to the CPU. And so the CPU was a 65C816, which if we jump over here to CPU world, uh, that was Western Des Design Center's processor. I admit I'm not really familiar with uh, WDC very much, but according to the specs, this was a 16-bit CPU internally, so that means that inside of the processor where it's processing data, it can do it in 16-bit chunks at a time. However, it had an 8-bit data bus, so even if it was able to process data in 16 bits, when it was communicating with the rest of the system, that, that can only be done in 8-bit chunks. Uh, there were different processors that acted like this, such as the... 6509 I believe it was um, by Motorola which was used in some arcade machines like Defender um, but you often had these disparities in the bus versus what the CPU could process in terms of bits to save on costs and so like if it had a full 16-bit data bus then it would have been a more expensive processor now it was capable of running up to 14 megahertz. Now this mentions that, um, of course this is also saying uh, RAM, but eight megahertz, four megahertz for outside memory. And then for 65 XE mode at 1.71 megahertz. So this wouldn't have ran it at its maximum potential. Um, it could also address up to 16 megabytes of RAM, but this, let's see, we have 512 bits of static RAM and I don't recall seeing if there was anything else. Here's a kind of a map of it all where you have your ROM, DRAM banks, but it doesn't mention exactly how much. It might have been that they didn't determine how much RAM this would have had at this point. Seems reasonable that it would have had at minimum uh, 64 kilobytes just because that's what the XE, the 65 XE had as I recall. Uh, but there was, um, or maybe it was the 65 XE that had 128 kilobytes of RAM. Sorry, you can crucify me in the comments if I'm getting all my uh, stuff wrong here, uh, all my numbers wrong. <laughs> but uh, I know there was an XE model that came with 128 kilobytes of RAM, uh, which either way, that was a lot more than what the Atari 7800 had. Now, of course, the 7800, I think it had... Uh, better color capabilities and it could do essentially unlimited sprites uh, as long as you had enough memory there and you could add in extra RAM into the cartridges to make up for that. But the 7800 was limited on its resolution modes. It did have a 320 uh, resolution mode, but it wasn't used very often because you couldn't do as much with it as you could in the 160 mode. Um, but the Super XE would have been more capable resolution wise and actually I think color wise overall if it had hit the 4096 color range it would have been able to do that whereas the 7800 I think could only do 256 colors on the screen at one time um, or something or maybe it was the palette uh, it could access the 256 colors on the palette 
Um, but overall, this would have been kind of an entry into the 16-bit stage, which, you know, if this is something, if this was a document that was produced, say, in 1986, and they had instead dumped the whole idea of the XE just being a repackaged XE computer and done this instead in 1987 or even 1988, then that probably would have been a better stepping stone to the Jaguar um, than what they did. <laughs> um, but let's keep going here past the uh, that map. And so again, it would have had a 65 XE mode of operation. I think that would imply that you would have backwards compatibility with XE games, um, which makes sense given that the at this time, you know, they were still actively pushing the XEGS, and then you had your extended mode of operation. Now, it's kind of interesting here that they already had crossed out certain things, such as the display, display list architecture, color or uh, luminance and chrominance outputs, composite video output. It looks like they just wanted to do analog RGB. Um, 640 dot mode as a bitmap instead of a line buffer. Uh, an object size multiplier. I guess that's what those things were earlier run the microprocessor at twice the clock. It's too bad that uh, they struck out the 3D mode there, but I suppose that's reasonable. I mean, what 3D could that processor do? I don't know. I mean, there have been some 3D demos uh, released on the uh, Atari 8-bit series before, showing that the 6502 and the GT and GTIA, if I say TIA or CHIA, then I guess it triggers some people out there uh, that, uh, that it was capable of such things but I suppose having a separate mode for that sort of thing might have caused the cost of this system to go up a bit. Object reflection uh, makes sense for different sprite artwork and being able to easily flip sprites uh, or obviously reflect them and had some line buffers, which was supposed to have 320 by six, but then they crossed that out to say five for whatever reason. Then uh, audio features, they wanted it to have stereo sound and eight channel PCM sound, but that would depend on the cost and a programmable sampling rate. I don't recall if any of this mentions the process or sorry the audio processor here let's look at the map I just got to tilt my sound. it just says sound so it looks like that hadn't been decided upon yet and so I wouldn't be surprised if it would have been something like the pokey but it could have been something that was backwards compatible with the pokey but enhanced I and mean, a lot of Atari's arcade machines did use two or even four pokey chips uh, to get more channels of sound and so to do eight channel sound pretty sure that's not something the pokey was capable of um, and of course you also had uh, the, the Yamaha sound chips in the ST so maybe that was something that they were looking at doing just again as long as it hit those particular points without costing too much now it does mention the io would use the carry chip now i recall kurt uh, saying that he was going to reveal more information on the carry from this um, thread on atari age mentions that the carry chip was actually or this and a couple of other posts that i found carry was in development and uh, before the Tremels had purchased Atari and was combining several of the 8-bit chips into one uh, and so that's where what that's talking about and so that's also might be where they were looking at maybe doing an enhanced version of that for the audio but that would have been the IO but uh, here in the general description, you have stereo digitized sound, 256 levels stored interleaved uh, in contiguous memory. This data is supplied directly to the two DAC converters or DACs uh, at a fixed rate. And yeah, it's got some sampling frequencies there and address control. Of course, this is all well and nice. Oh, this document came from a little earlier in 1988. But of course, since 
it looks like they hadn't actually decided on what they were going to use yet. It was just kind of, you know, these are things we're throwing out there. We'll discuss and see where we want to go from there. And that's where they had some questions about it and even a little hand note to answer next meeting <laughs> as to where that would go. Um, so, you know, what would games have looked like on this? Again, best guess is maybe like a low-end Amiga game uh, from the time. It, it's always going to be impossible to say unless somebody was to create, say, like an FPGA with all that. But again, without knowing exactly what sort of RAM it would have used and uh, sound chips and IO chips and all that stuff, it might always be impossible to say. I mean, it certainly would have looked better than the Atari 8-bit line. Um, should have looked better than the Atari 7800 as well. But I'm sure the reason why they decided not to go with this is because, well, in 1988 is when you had the Sega Genesis come out. Obviously, that would have crushed what this is. And again, by the time that this came along, it just wouldn't have been powerful enough to compete. Uh, it certainly wouldn't have been able to compete with the SNES either. And so, uh, I mean, maybe something like the TurboGrafx-16, uh, but still just would have been too little too late. And really looking at all of this, it probably would have made more sense to make a consoleized version of the Atari Lynx, which was uh, quite powerful uh, for what its graphics engines were capable of and what the Suzy, I think it was the Suzy, or sorry, the Mikey chip was capable of doing in terms of audio. And all, it, all a consoleized Lynx would have needed was, uh, you know, having some resolution modes that would have been higher than what the handheld version was capable of. But, uh, you know, perhaps they wanted to pursue that at some point. But either way, from what I can find out from what Kurt Vendel had said on Atari Age was that uh, it seemed like there were several different projects being kicked around at Atari. I, I know there was talk of doing the Atari ST as a game console, a consoleized version of that. And that just never happened. Uh, there's the mysterious Atari Mirai case that's out there. Um, some have wondered if the Super XE here was supposed to use that or not. Um, there was also another design that Kurt Vendel had come across in discussions of this Super XE design, which would have used the Atari 8-bit XE motherboard, but instead of the GTIA or GTIA um, chip in there, it would have used the Atari 7800's Maria chip, uh, which could have been interesting, although uh, in one sense, it almost just seems like the, there wasn't much point to doing that, and perhaps that's why that never was done, because the that would really just be an Atari 7800 with 64 kilobytes of RAM, because it also used uh, a 6502 microprocessor uh, on it, just like the Atari 8-bits did. Um, I, I guess you would have a few minor differences with things like the Antic chip, um, but yeah, it might have just made more sense to do a, a Super 7800 uh, or um, yeah, just have more RAM in that thing. And of course, it, the 7800 needed, needed a better sound chip. Um, but that is, as far as we know, what the Super XE was, or at least one of those designs. Uh, it also seems like it was not long after this where suddenly they just jumped to the Atari Panther and began developing that. Uh, but, of course, that's probably something worth spending time on a video. But it, it does seem to fit with the timeline that they were looking at this first, and then they started some more serious development on the Panther, and then, of course, the Jaguar came. And so that's why this would be a stepping stone in that direction. Um, but uh, what do you think about this? Do you think Atari made the wise choice in not releasing this sort of design and Again, this probably would have come out in 1989 or 1990. Um, or do you think that they should have done it so that they would have at least had some sort of stop gap between the 7800 and the Jaguar? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And don't get too triggered over my use of certain terms. And we'll see you on the next video.